Welcome to Cool Talk. Today we discuss the Incas. Now, in the other videos, we discussed the Aztecs and the Mayans, and as advanced as they were with their calendars and their astronomy, if you ventured away from the palaces and temples, the infrastructure was primitive, but not the Incas. In the 16th century, Pedro de Cieza of Spain arrived in the Andes in Peru. He marveled and said, and to think that God should have permitted something so great to remain hidden from the world for so long in history, unknown to men. It had taken thousands of years for the Asians who crossed the Bering Strait to make their way down to the Andes. It was the largest empire the world had at that time, 2,000 miles long from Quito, Ecuador to Santiago, Chile. Extreme altitudes, extreme hot, extreme cold. 40,000 people governed 10 million people who spoke 30 different languages. And yet, the Incan Empire only lasted about 100 years. Let's begin. Everybody lived in an Ailu. That's a region where a group of families worked together in a portion of land and shared everything, with good portions going to the state and the priesthood. Once you were born into an Ailu, you were there for life. And you didn't own the land, the state did. Everybody worked hard, all day, every day, for a life. Until you couldn't work anymore. You did not have weekends off, only religious festivals. No weekends, you farmed, you built, you cooked, you made clothes, etc., and you paid taxes. Taxes were paid in crop, or it could be paid off in military labor. Now, nobles worked less. They could own land, and they didn't pay any taxes. You wore tunics or dresses. In cold weather, you would put on a cape or a poncho. Your hairstyle would tell everybody your social status and what ailu you were with. You lived in an adobe brick house with little furniture and you slept on a mat on the floor. You ate maize, squash, roots, grains, guinea pigs, llamas, and fish. There was no written language. Only the nobles studied anything. You learned a trade or a craft and babies were not coddled. They were not hugged. You just gave them the basic food and put them down. And for the most part, you lived in the Ailu your entire life. Men would carry around a little pouch with coca leaves. Now, coca leaves, if you chew them, were known to give energy bursts, reduce appetite, numb pain, remedies altitude sickness, may help ulcers and digestion, had vitamins A, B, C, and E, remedies an upset stomach, menstrual cramps, and if you were going to be sacrificed to the gods, well, you chew a lot of it and it would put you in a numbed trance. Today, you can drink chicha beer, which has been around for centuries. If you look at this contrast right here, you see a lady preparing beer made out of corn back then, and here she is making beer out of corn today. The chicha beer was used in many religious festivals. It was a monarchy. The king was called the Sapa Inca, and his wife, the queen, was called the Koya. And he was surrounded by military officers, governors, high priests, viceroys, etc. And the empire was divided into quarters, each quarter called a Sayu. Now, you can sustain the empire. You, you give the people security, irrigation, roads, etc. And they give you crops, labor, and tribute. This knotted string is called a kipu. The Incas did not have a written language, but they would communicate with a bunch of string with little knots that represented words or symbols or numbers. 
and with this they would communicate across the land sending their runners out to send messages. The Kori Gancha temple in Cusco had its walls and floors covered in gold. Now, before you complain about the extravagant waste, keep in mind that for the Incas, gold was not a currency, it was just pretty stones. It was not as valuable as it was to us. And look how evenly these stone bricks are laid together. And the Incas did not have motar. They didn't use any metal instruments. They just chiseled stone against stone. When you died, you were embalmed and mummified. The climate helped to preserve the body. Now, if an emperor died, his mummy was guarded, and during religious festivals, the mummy was brought out of the palace and paraded around. They would change his clothes and everything. And look at these preserved bodies over here. There was children's sacrifice. Very sad if you look at this. But look how amazingly well these bodies have preserved. One point of interest. If you study the DNA in these mummies, you'll notice they are tied to, partly tied to, the islanders in the Pacific Ocean. The Incas worshipped objects called huacas. A huaca could be natural like a waterfall, a rock, but it could also be a statue. Now I mentioned there was some human sacrifice, there definitely was animal sacrifice, but not as prevalent as the Aztecs or the Mayans. The Inca stone buildings seemed like they were built by giants. Some of the stones were 200 tons in weight. They used irrigation systems, brought water to all the people. They had water storage and food storage techniques. And while everybody worked hard, the government provided all your needs. If you were too old or disabled to work, you were provided for. The city of Machu Picchu is 8,000 feet above sea level in the mountain ranges. It is believed to have been built around 1450. The stone rocks were fitted together by hundreds of workers with grass ropes and levers. It has 140 buildings and 100 stone steps. Called the Forgotten City, Westerners didn't discover it, the ruins, until 1911. No commoners lived there except for some workers. It was for nobles and officers and the king. It had a temple, storage rooms, and homes, and many wonder of the religious significance. But now, some sources say it was just a vacation home for the king. But as high as Machu Picchu is, the Incan capital, Cusco, is over 3,000 feet higher. Cusco was where the Saya, sorry, the Sapa Inca, the king, lived along with his nobles. Now, the emperor lived in a palace, and when he died, the palace would hold his mummified corpse. And the new emperor had to build his own palace. The fortress in Cusco had walls of stones that weigh 200 tons. The stones are fitted together so tightly you, can, you can't slide a sheet of paper between them. Inca ancestors go back at least 4,000 years. We find evidence of farming villages at that time. 900 BCE, there was a civilization that we call today the Chavin. They built temples and buildings. They had granite black limestone brought from somebody, somewhere else. They uh, domesticated the llama, and they grew potatoes and corn and cotton. They also built huge irrigation systems that would influence the Incas later. There were other civilizations like the Paracas and another civilization called the Topara. In 100 AD, the Nazca civilization built aqueducts that they called puquios that were so sophisticated they can be used today. However, the Nazcas are famous today because of their Nazca lines. They would draw these huge hummingbirds and spiders that you could only see from the air, from airplanes. People think that this is evidence that there were aliens back then, but um, this is evidence of nothing. Building something on the ground could have given them comfort just knowing that those lines are there. We don't know. Then came civilizations such as the Huari, the Moche, the Chimu. They would expand the territory militarily. They also worshipped the moon, thinking the moon was more powerful than the sun because you could see the moon during the day sometimes. They had copper and gold and silver and pottery. They were very, very influential with the Incas. Then in 1200 AD came Manco Capac. 
He was a, a nomad who lived in an Ailu somewhere in today's Pumara, Peru. He traveled and he fought three tribes in the Cusco Valley, the Sahuares, the Huayes, and the Alcahuizas. He settled in the area and founded the city of Cusco. He fought other tribes that look at Manco Capac as an invader. He would die of natural causes. During Manco Capac's reign, there were adobe pyramids, there was expansion of the land, they worshipped Mars, there was human sacrifice that took place during these times. There were two strong families, the Urins and the Hanans. And uh, Manco Capac came from the Urin dynasty. For five generations, the land was governed by the Urins. But then, uh, the fifth Sapa Inca, the fifth king, the Capac Yupanqui, his son, who was his successor, was killed. Some say he was killed by the Hanan family. In any case, because the son was killed, he chose another son that he had with another wife from the Hanan side of the kingdom to be his successor. And that began the Hanan dynasty. When Kapakupanki died, Inca Roca became the next king. And his son became king next at 19, Yawar Wakak, who was a great military conqueror. The next king, Viracocha Inca, the next Sapa Inca, he had several sons. In 1438, when the tribe of the Chancas were threatening to invade, Viracocha left. He left some of his sons behind and they fought and defeated the Chancas. But then the sons fought among themselves, killing one of them. And Viracocha died of grief. The next Sapa Inca was Pachacuti Inca Yupanqui, he conquered many tribes. He was an exceptional leader. Under him began the great expansion. In three generations, most of West South America was conquered. He rebuilt Cusco. He built Machu Picchu. But his reign began very repressive tactics. And he had his son Tupac Inca Yupanqui to conquer as well. When Tupac Inca Yupanqui became Sasapa, he continued to conquer. He extended the realm. When he died in 1493, he had two legitimate sons and 90 illegitimate children. The next Sapa was Huayna Capac. He had several marriages, including his sister, because yes, the Inca royalty practiced incest to preserve the bloodline. He had at least 50 children. He extended the land further south to Argentina and Chile. However, this is around the time the Spaniards had come into South America and smallpox was killing millions. And along the way, the Sapa himself, Huayna Capac, died of smallpox. So did his brother and so did his son, the successor. But then two sons take over, Huascar and Atahualpa. They divide the empire and govern peacefully for about four years. But then Huascar takes Cusco and has Atahualpa put in prison. But Atahualpa escapes and the two brothers go to civil war against each other for about five years. In 1532, Atahualpa wins the war and imprisons Huascar. But a year later, a Spaniard named Francisco Pizarro arrives with a small army. He attacks and kills 6,000 Incan soldiers and he imprisons Atahualpa. The Incas were already weakened by civil war and smallpox. So Atahualpa promised Pizarro that if Pizarro would let him go, he would fill the room that he was in with gold and twice that amount in silver. The room was 22 feet long and 17 feet wide. Guess what? Atahualpa and his men complied. They got the gold. But rather than let him go, Pizarro said that Atahualpa was an idolater and sentenced him to death. Now, Atahualpa was going to be burned to death, and in fear that his body would not come back in the afterlife, he agreed to convert to Catholicism, and instead of being burned to death, he was strangled. The Incas were put to work in the mines for silver and gold, and as for Pizarro, well, some rival Spaniards came along and killed him. Now, a couple of hundred thousand Incas ran off to Vilcabamba and they fought against the Spaniards. The last Sapa Inca was Tupac Amaru, but he was eventually captured in 1572. And before being executed, he said, Pachacamac, witness how my enemies shed my blood. The Inca Empire was no more. So the inhabitants of the great Inca Empire were now working the gold and silver mines where 8 million Incas died in colonial times. To help de the decrease in manpower, African slaves were brought in to help. In the middle of all of this, 
Spain got increasingly rich. The Incan capital was now Lima. In the 1600s, Martin de Porres became a priest and devoted his life to take care of the sick. When an epidemic hit the land, he opened up the doors of the convent to the sick, even though the church ordered him not to. He opened orphanages, helped abandoned children, and he collected money for the poor, even begging for it himself. The Inquisition was introduced. Now, outside of that, there was a lot of preaching and persuasion. Churches were erected in every single town. And South America today's 422 million people are overwhelmingly Catholic. Now, the intermarriages between the Incas, Europeans, and Africans brought about Mestizos and Afro-Peruvians. In the 18th century, Juan Gabriel Contorcanqui took up the name Tupac Amaru II and started a rebellion. But the rebellion failed. 100,000 natives died. Tupac Amaru was forced to see his wife, his uncle, and his son executed right before him, before having his own tongue cut out and his limbs torn off and then his head cut off. Now, the rest of South America was relatively unpopulated. Um, You had the Guarani natives that were being pushed aside by the uh, Portuguese. You had nomads that were going down to Argentina. And you had Arawaks and other pockets of civilizations up north. In 1808, French statesman Napoleon Bonaparte invaded and took Spain, putting his brother in charge. And now everything changed. Spanish rule in the Americas was no longer stable. And so, Simón Bolívar, one of the most influential people of all time, joined up with José de San Martín to fight Spanish rule and liberate the Americas. Now, he was not a good general, but he was relentless, battle after battle after battle, losing, putting the army back together again. And in the end, he liberated Venezuela, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Peru. Yet, Bolivar was disappointed. He didn't want to have several republics. He wanted to have one unified country, a superpower in the Americas, not a bunch of republics that were infighting among themselves. Uh, He gave his uh, fortune and his energies all to the cause. And in the end, he died poor and disappointed. In honor of Tupac Amaru I and II, this in Uruguay, an urban guerrilla group named themselves the Tupamaros. And in Colombia, this band right over here did the same thing. And let's not forget this rapper, Tupac Amaru Shakur. So South America fascinates us, the backdrop, a continent of rainforests, deserts, and skyscrapers. We're going to touch more on them later on in colonial history. But first, my next video will be the history of Christianity. And after that, a video on the timeline of history up to the time of Christ. But in the meantime, send me your thoughts, recommendations, or better yet, subscribe. This is Cool Talk.